Thank you, Emma, that we are recording the session um, and so that these can be saved later um, onto um, our website for further viewing. Um, it doesn't record the Q&A session, just so you know, but we'll go through that in a moment. All right, so can I begin just by acknowledging that the land we meet on today is the traditional lands for the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge that the Ghana people are the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. All right. For those of you who are familiar with the Commission on Excellence and Innovation on Health, or CEIH as we like to call it, we're the lead agency for innovation and healthcare in South Australia. And we look to bring consumers, clinicians and other collaborators together to turn our ideas into better healthcare. So our vision is obviously for better healthcare and to do this, we really need your support and we need to look at how we can create and imagine new ideas for better healthcare. We acknowledge also that better doesn't mean always excellent, but we commit to measuring and working towards that so we can see the changes that we're making. So this question, what if the big idea was connecting all the small ideas? That is the essence of why we host these sessions like this today. It is to connect all of us together. It's about South Australia. We are South Australian centric and we have make no apologies for that. Um, and we look to connect you all in different areas and different parts of the healthcare system across the state. So this month's theme is around vulnerable populations. We're up to series five. Earlier this month, we heard from Professor Chris Barnett, who spoke about thalassemia in pregnancy, um, and Associate Professor Josephine Thomas, who spoke about the transition from paediatric to adult health services with complex health needs. Um, and today we're really excited to have Dr. Michael Page here today. He's going to be speaking to us about building a positive culture in the REPAT Neurobehavioural Unit. Um, following the Oakton report and the subsequent response to the report, a Neurobehavioural Unit was planned and oper operationalised at the REPAT Health Precinct. Um, and Michael will talk to us about this. My, um, I understand the unit is there to support the care of very severe to extreme behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. Um, and I really look forward to hearing from Dr. Page today. So today's improvements showcase, they, in general, they happen most Thursdays at one o'clock. They're online, they're free, as you've discovered. So please share that with your friends. But we also do take just the presentation of it as well. So that's always online um, soon after the presentation. So if you've missed any presentations that you're particularly interested in, you can always go back and bring that together. The showcase, as I mentioned, is all about bringing healthcare teams together and providing a space to explore what others have learned. Um, and keeping in touch and keeping it simple. Um, the other thing, just a little bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Michael. Um, as I mentioned, the recording will stop at the end of Michael's presentation so that people feel really open um, and comfortable to be able to ask questions. Can you remember to keep your mics on mute? Um, if the technology starts getting a bit glitchy, some of us will turn our cameras off, Michael, to give you the best chance. Um, and I look forward to hearing from you. So without further ado, I'm going to um, unshare my screen and hand over to Michael. Thank you very much, Nadia. So um, I do have some slides to talk to today. So um, I will uh, share my screen in a minute, um, but uh, I thought I'd show my face first and uh, we'll get to have a bit of a chat at the end as well around some, any, any questions you might have for me. Um, as uh, Nadia mentioned, um, I work um, in the Older Persons Mental Health Service in Salem. I'm the head of unit. Uh, I am a consultant psychiatrist and I um, have got an advantage certificate in old age psychiatry. Um, I do uh, support um, the REPAT Neurobehavioural Unit in addition to our acute 
unit, inpatient unit and our community team. So um, I'm very privileged today to be asked to um, speak to you and present um, at, at this really wonderful opportunity to, to share um, not only what we're doing, but um, obviously um, lots of wonderful things are happening around the state. So to have a platform to share that, um, I think is a, a really exciting um, opportunity. So I thank you um, for the invitation to talk and, and I hope um, you, uh, yeah, this, this really um, stimulates you to have a think um, and, uh, and I'm yeah, more, than welcome to, more than welcome to answer any questions at the end. So um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, now if someone could just um, give me the thumbs up if that's worked. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, so I'll be talking today about um, building a positive culture in the REPAT Neurobehavioural Unit. Um, thank you, Nadia, for your acknowledgement of country earlier on. I might also like to acknowledge um, that the Ghana people are the traditional custodians of the, of the Adelaide Plains and pay respects to elders past, present and future. And we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. So the vulnerable population that I'll be talking about today in this series um, are, are people who live with dementia, who experience very severe to extreme behavioural and psychological symptoms of dementia. Um, I will shorten that to BPSD as we talk. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and, the, and the types of um, things that we might see for these consumers could be vocalisations, increased motor activity, um, agitation or aggression, resistance to care provision, um, could be sexual behaviours, psychosis, emotional dysregulation, and, and many other things that, that are um, distressing for that person. Um, I'll just remind people that I'm, I'm actually in a room with the light that goes out if I don't move. So every now and then I'm going to move to turn it back on. Um, and so these vulnerable people um, have care needs that exceed what can be supported in mainstream residential aged care sector. Um, many have trialled and have been transferred from multiple facilities, which is not only traumatic for, for the individual, but also for families as well. Um, these consumers are often not frail, they're often very fit and strong, um, and, and often with younger onset dementia presentations, although not always. Um, just for a very quick reference, um, BPSD is often um, uh, considered within the, the tiers um, presented by Bradati and others in, in an article in the Medical Journal of Australia. Um, the consumers that uh, uh, we support the care of are those that, that fit in the extreme and at the very tip of the very severe BPSD. So the tier sixes and the tier sevens, um, although the unit is mostly um, designed for tier seven, um, which is actually rare. Um, and we do, uh, the epidemiology suggests it's about 24 people in South Australia at any one time with this level of uh, uh, BPSD. Prior to 2017, many of these consumers received long-term specialist care at the Oakden Older Persons Mental Health Service. Um, and I assume that most have heard about Oakden. Um, if not, I would encourage people to read the Oakden report that was, that was uh, released in 2017, following some significant concerns that arose um, around the care that was provided at Oakden. Um, and there were a number of issues that were identified around um, the current operating model of care at the time, the staffing model, quality and safety of care. Culture was a really important part of the things that, that were found to be lacking at Oakton and also the use of restrictive practices. Um, subsequent to that report, Oakton closed um, and some consumers were supported into residential aged care sector and then others were moved to places of care at Northgate House, which, was, which is operated by the NAL and Older Person Mental Health Service. Um, and, it's, it, and, and Northgate House is still operating today and it's a wonderful service. Um, however, until this year, any new consumers who need the, needed this specialised care who weren't able to access the places of care at Northcote were supported in, in many non-ideal settings, including acute hospital environments. And so the vulnerable populations were made even more vulnerable um, for a number of years in the, the gap between the closure of Oakden um, and this year. 
Um, so that's the Oakton report. Following the Oakton report was the Oakton report response, where a, a number of people um, got together to really look at ways that we could um, uh, uh, change the way that things happened at Oakton and never do it again. Um, and so a number of expert working groups got together, focusing on all of the areas of deficiency that was seen um, in, in Oakton with multiple stakeholder engagement, both within the working parties and through external consultation as well. Um, just for noting, it did focus on both people living with dementia as well as people living with an enduring mental illness. Um, for our service, um, we, are, we, are, we are provide care to those living with dementia. Um, in 2020, the Older Persons Mental Health Service in Salem, which I work in, and was giving governance to develop a neurobehavioural unit at the REPAT Health Precinct for consumers living with dementia and Tier 7 BPSD. And we followed on from the really wonderful work that was done um, and commenced in the 2018 project. So what we had was a, a new unit, uh, a new service um, with, with all new staff and, and very much a new start. So we had a clean slate to, to start from. Um, just for the context for people who don't know, the, neuro, the REPAT Neurobehavioural Unit um, is a deliberately designed dementia enabling environment. It's not a brand new build. It was built into the uh, previous um, acute older person service on the REPAC campus. There are three pods, each with six places of care and, every, and everyone has their own bedroom and ensuite. Um, currently we, we've occupied two of the pods. Um, there's a shared dining area with a food services model to reflect home-like mealtimes with very spacious internal and external lived environments um, and, and a dedicated space external to the living areas for carers, a bit of a breakout zone. Um, we opened in February, which started taking our first consumers in February of this year. So we've been, um, been going for about six months now. And very much, you know, we, we are still learning, evolving and developing um, from a from a base that you know we, we were very happy to start with, but we um, by no means feel that we, we are experts yet, but we're getting there. Um, an important part of um, the development of the REPAT MBU, um, we believe was the cultural framework and, and reading the Oakton report, you know, the culture um, was something that was really significant um, that, that you know perhaps contributed to, to, to many of the, the failings. Um, and, and, and an organization's culture is an extremely important thing. And it's very often very hard to define. Um, but certainly the key principles in the culture of the REPA MBU that we pride ourselves on and that we expect is that, that staff are passionate about the care of people living with dementia, particularly those with the most extreme care needs. Staff exhibit values of compassion with a drive to achieve the interpersonal connectedness with meaningful engagement that is necessary to support um, these vulnerable people. With a real focus on person-centered care and a real thirst and desire to learn about the whole person and their life experience, not just the, the dementia or the symptoms. Um, and we want to know about both positive and negative life experiences, including you know, significant traumas that may have occurred in that person's life their work experience, hobbies, relations, connections, everything about that person that makes them um, you know, more than just a, a, a patient. Um, and, and the way that we do that is we sort of perceive a, a triangle of care. So in between the staff, the person living with dementia and the family and, and carers, building up really important relations and connections. So how have we developed this? And, and obviously um, uh, the title of this, this uh, talk with building a, a cultural framework and we're still building we haven't finished yet and I don't think we'll ever finish but how did we start to, to really look at how we build the culture in the neurobehavioral unit we started by trying to find the right people um, and and we we really um, focused on a values-based recruitment as I said this was a whole new staff um, and workforce we also wanted to find the right tools and the right framework to be able to build that culture. And we, we have chosen a program called the My Home Life Program. And I'll talk about both of these things in a minute. And the ways that we've sort of continued to build that is that we're connecting with our consumers and our carers. We involve our carers in the care planning, including coming into team-based meetings that would traditionally be sort of clinician only. 
Um, we do, we're doing things very differently. One environmental difference of our, of our uh, unit is we don't have a traditional nursing station. Um, all of the care is on the floor with the consumers all the time. Um, we are learning, we're evolving, and we're challenging each other along the way as we learn. And I think the most important thing and the things that, that, that we've noticed and other people notice when they visit is that there's laughter, there's fun, there's singing and dancing and joy, which balances out all of the challenges that are posed when someone is experiencing um, dementia at that highest extremity. With our regards to our values-based recruitment, I mean, this started from the application. We, we loaded the application with a question to say, you know, what, what do you bring that aligns itself, yourself to the model of care of the, the REPAD MBU? We used um, some psychometric assessments called Hogan assessments, and that looked at individual motives, values and preferences, and traits that link to safe behaviours, which provided us um, uh, assistance in, in really making sure that um, not only um, you know, what we saw in interviews, that that was matched with, with the sort of the, those traits that people carry. The interview questions themselves were written to draw out evidence of connection and passion for high quality of care for older people, including demonstrating uh, understanding about the special needs for those with severe and extreme BPSD. For the senior positions, the panel included a carer with lived experience um, who had a family member cared for at Oakton. Uh, it was wonderful um, as head of unit sharing those panels with that gentleman um, who, who really contributed um, uh, significantly to um, the interview process. Um, we used photos in the interview, which really were designed to elicit how people felt um, uh, and when seeing these photos. Um, we, we were a challenge for our HR department. I think they thought that we um, were, were uh, a bit mad, um, and, uh, but through the process, um, you know, we, we've had lots of very positive feedback from from our HR department to say, to say, you know, you guys did a did a really wonderful job in your recruitment. And so my home life. Um, so for those who are familiar with the Oakton um, documents, um, the cited within that is the work of Belinda Dewar, who's a co-director of the My Home Life program in the UK, um, and. Initially, we, we wondered, do we need a formal cultural framework? Um, um, the Sahel and Older Persons Mental Health Service operate you know, a, an inpatient unit, a community team. We already have a, a culture that we could have brought over into our um, new service. But we thought, no, we actually needed something. We did contemplate the um, framework that was adopted by the Northgate House team. Um, and that was sort of immediately after Oakton closed down. Um, but we did decide for ourselves that the principles in the My Home Life program really resonated the most with, with our team and where we were at in, in, uh, in, in caring for people with BPSD. And we felt it was extremely important to have some scaffolding to build culture on. And it's not, and you can't just buy a good culture off the shelf. We just knew that we had to have the framework and the scaffolding that we could we could build that on. We knew we had the staff. We just needed to be able to, you know, have something to latch it on to. Um, we made direct contact with Belinda Dewar in Scotland, and after you know a series of emails back and forth um, and some Zoom calls. Um, a partnership was forged and in collaboration with the SA Innovation Hub, who hosts the My Home Life program in Australia. And the My Home Life program started in, in residential aged care and promoted quality of care for those living, dying, visiting and working in care settings for older people. We saw it, certainly saw it resonated for our space. And I'd have to say, you know, I, I'm convinced that this is a program that resonates for all care, not just for older people um, in, in this environment, but across the spectrum of health. Um, as I said, it started in the UK, but it's now spreading across the world in a number of centres. And it's sort of seen almost as a social movement. Um, and it's ways of connecting with people to maximise the potential for meaningful connection and relationships. Um, and it's about how we build best practice together, how we connect with people to build a, you know, a really great um, service. And, and it is an evidence-based program as well. And the way that we are uh, implementing that in our neurobehavioural unit, um, we are engaged in a leadership program with the SA Innovation Hub. Um, we're, we're developing our skills directly through the My Home Life program in Scotland, and we're weaving them this approach into our systems and processes in, in our unit. 
So we have a core group of um, uh, eight initially and now nine staff members across the spectrum of our workforce, um, including our allied health um, uh, lived experience and also our, our, one of our admin staff as well. Um, and so we're in a month, we have monthly sessions with the SA Innovation Hub here in Adelaide. Um, where we are developing the skills to both only to not only um, use ourselves, but to teach and support the principles of the My Home Life program. Um, and in between these sessions, we utilise these techniques in the MBU, and then we subsequently reflect back um, in the subsequent sessions just to you know, continue to improve our skills. Um, in parallel to these sessions, um, we're having a su we supplement those with a direct program with Belinda Dewar and, and her colleagues in Scotland. Um, and we're still working through those and we have sessions scheduled and programmed till the end of 2021. It's really wonderful to do that. Um, it's an early start for us, but it's a very late um, night for them. They, they do it from about 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Um, so we're very, very um, uh, uh, grateful for their um, uh, engagement with us. And this really challenging and stimulating learning for, for the leaders, and certainly I speak for myself, but I know the others as well, um, and looking at ways that we can, you know, it transfers uh, into the way we work at, at the MBU. Um, so ways that you know we we use the the principles and tools, the things that we do. So we 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 look at ways that we work. So agreed ways of working, and and we negotiate that within our teams and with each other. There are certain tools through the program that we might use that are, might be icebreakers or different ways that we can connect with people and get to know people at the start of you know, any interactions or meetings or different programs. Um, and it's ways to tap into emotional language. And we use that with staff, with carers, and sometimes even some of our consumers. There's been some really wonderful examples where um, we've engaged these tools with some of our consumers and, and gotten some, some really great um, connections out of those. Um, there are image cards we use, different questions and ways to ask those questions and different prompts and different ways that we can touch on people's emotional um, language. One really important way that, that we use the My Home Life principles is called caring conversations. Um, the thing I like about the My Home, My Home Life program, it's, it's not rocket science. Um, it, it's really, really sensible. And, and it, you know, these are things that we intuitively do, but it's nice to put names to it and a framework as well. So the seven C's, it's being courageous. Um, often we're not courageous and it's really encouraging us all to be courageous and also be curious, connecting emotionally, um, celebrating, and um, we also don't celebrate often, um, but it's really important to celebrate, um, collaborate, considering others' perspectives, and, and also compromise, which is really important. We also, when we're focusing on relationships, um, um, and within the program is, is the census framework, um, which uh, was introduced by another author, uh, Mike Nolan and others. Um, and the census framework is essentially a, a, um, a suite of different senses, so not your eyes, ears, nose and mouth, um, but things, senses of being. And so in order to feel um, balanced, we all need to feel a sense of security, a sense of belonging, a sense of continuity, a sense of purpose, a sense of achievement and a sense of significance. And so we're embedding these senses in all of our interactions with our staff, our consumers and carers. And if we're not meeting them, often that, that leads to you know, elements of conflict or unhappiness. And so it's a really good way that we can focus on that. And the ways that we can bring it all together and working with people is being appreciative and using a tool that's called appreciative inquiry, where we working with people to actually improve the things that we're doing well. And quite often um, we're reactive and we fix the things that are problems, but we often don't focus on the things that we're actually really doing well and just doing more of it. Um, and so with appreciative inquiry, it's a way that we can really work with people to say, well, what do we want to see? What are we doing well? How do we how do we support each other to keep doing that? And, and then, you know, eventually the problems put, get pushed out because we're just doing the good stuff um, more of the time. Um, and for me, this is sort of almost like the Ten Commandments of the, the My Home Life Principles and Appreciative Inquiry. But I, I mean, I really love these very simple statements that, that you know, make an awful lot of sense and, and resonate across all of the My Home Life 
um, cultural framework. So words create worlds. The things we say, how we describe people, often impacts the way that that, that you know we we start thinking about them. Um, and I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, we are the experts of our own experience, and we we can't you know ever understand what someone else has gone through. We can only understand what we've gone through. Um, what we focus on grows and expands. So focus on the good stuff and the good stuff will continue to grow. Um, we work with people rather than on people, uh, which is really, you know, it's an interesting because we often, as you know, managers, we, we work within our lines, um, but, but, but really what we want to do is actually work with people. Um, we can't change others, but through changing ourselves, others will respond differently. Um, nice one and stories of the souls of an organization help us to learn what we care about and curious questions are an action in themselves and curiosity pervades through the my home loaf way of doing things so you know how are we going we're six months in so our leadership group is halfway through the program it's been rewarding stimulating emotionally challenging there's been tears um i've never been so emotionally tested in my life but i've never enjoyed something in my you know, professional learning um, that, that spills over into you know, even my personal life as well. Um, I've never enjoyed something so much. Um, much has already been learned and shared and we've built some really wonderful connections with our staff, our consumers and our carers. Um, our staff enjoy coming to work despite the challenges of, of a unit such as ours. Um, developing appreciations of consumers as people and not just as a diagnosis or a challenging behaviour. And, and it's really changed the way that we work. And with new recruitment waves, we've continued to successfully use the values-based principles. And I can say we have a, a really wonderful workforce that works here in this unit. So it's a bit early for us to have formally evaluated outcomes of the My Home Life program, and we are, we will be doing that in time. Um, and, and there are some confounding variables, such as you know the, the the dementia enabling physical environment. But I but I can say that you know we've seen a reduction in the use of psychotropic medications. We've seen significant reduction in code blacks or serious security incidents as well. Um, and uh, and our staff are just satisfied, and they've got high morale. Um, and and that is impacting on the way they are inter impact, interacting with people. Our feedback from family and carers has been really helpful. Um, and it's not all been positive and that's fine. Um, and because when it's not been positive and there are things that we could be doing better, we've just simply used all of the techniques that we're learning um, with the My Home Life program to, to work with people to, to do things better. So um, in saying that, we've also had some really positive feedback as well. The future. Um, so we will complete the My Home Life Leadership Program and the group, core group of us um, will continue to embed the principles into the REPAT MBU, but we have then an opportunity to be teachers and we'll expand the program further. Um, we are sharing our knowledge and we'll continue to do so with um, the Division of Mental Health and, and SALIN more broadly. Um, and we're incorporating our learnings in, LA, in our LHN-wide committee, such as our challenging behaviour committees, code black responses and minimising of restrictive practices. Practices. And we are even thinking about now, can we reframe the way we do things such as our PRNDs and can we embed the census framework to really understand you know, what it is that people are getting out of being at work? Um, research is a really important um, aspect of what we plan to do. And, and we've got uh, the collaborations with the SA Innovation Hub and their program as well. And, and I think it's fair to say we've come a long way from the Oakton service and the cultural challenges there um, but, you know, I think, you know, we've still got lots of evolving to do, um, focusing on positive culture, and I'm really excited about that. Um, for reference, um, there are a number of references if people do want to um, uh, have these slides. Um, just a few photos from our unit. So, you know, we put these up and this is in our carer area. So, so they know, you know, what we're doing. There's no secrets um, of how we are deliberately wanting to, you know, be in our unit and the way that we engage. And we want our carers to actually use these same techniques when they're engaging with us. So we can have those, you know, really respectful um, conversations. Um, the way with words, we invite our family members, our staff, if they find something that is a word that they don't quite like, we ask them to flip it. Or we challenge each other as well. Um, and zooming up on our language board and just examples of things such as sort of um, what we tend to say, they refuse 
to do something. So we say they chose not to or did not want to. Um, Someone um, is being, you know, we we'll often say uh, uh, we manage people, but we don't manage people, we support people. And there, there are some semantics with this, but it makes a big difference of how we, you know, use our language um, and in, in respecting people. Um, you know, the, the, the clothes protectors, we're calling it, I mean, they, they, some people call them bibs. Um, these are adults, these aren't babies. They don't wear bibs, they wear clothes protectors. And so these are just some examples of, of those things. And as I said, we sing. Um, this is me at St. Patrick's Day. It's a wonderful unit. Um, uh, we open up people's um, you know, lives within their dementia. Um, and that day was, I, I still have fond memories of that day. And we had a number of our consumers dance, play harmonica, sing. Um, and to me, that embedded uh, you know, the culture that, that we want in, in such a unit. And, and you would not have known that this was a tier seven BPSD unit. You would have thought this was a one big happy family, which for me, um, you know, that, that, that is the culture that I wanna work in. So, um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, and so what I'd, I want to invite um, the audience today is you know, rather than say, what questions do you have? I want you to think about what you're curious about and, and what you're wondering about having heard this presentation today. I'm more than happy to um, you know, reflect on any of those things or elaborate um, if you've got any, any things that you want to know more about. So I will stop sharing my screen um, so we can see each other's faces. And so thank you for, thank you all for listening.